fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. Good morning and welcome to my father's place. We are talking about First and Second Corinthians and we are doing 1 Corinthians 13, known as the love chapter today. And the title of my Bible study is To a Church in Crisis with Love. And I'm going to tell you today what that love is. And the Lord showed me something so cool about it. And I'm going to share that with you so you understand the depths of it. Oh, hallelujah. So I'll pray and we'll get right into it. Father, I thank you for revealing this more deeply to me. I'm always asking you to do that by your Holy Spirit, who teaches me all things. Jesus, this is for the upbuilding of your church, that she may become mature and no longer think as children. I pray that you would work this today and work it through me. Speak through me by your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, I know that you will glorify the Father and the Son. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 13, all 13 verses. And then we'll go down through it, and I'll explain. If I were going to give this a title, it would be Compelled by God's Divine love. So let me speak it. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not behave indecently. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as also I have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Oh, what a chapter. This is deep, and it's wonderful. Jump in. Now, I gave it the title Compelled by God's Divine Love because almost to a man, the church misses this. Most of the commentators I've ever heard miss it. Dr. Dennis Kinlaw, who was at Asbury Theological Seminary, he got it, and there are a few others. But most of the time, what happens with the commentators is they look at the word love and define it by way of human emotion and moral sensibility. No! <laughs> Sorry, guys, you're not getting it, because human love will never do. You and I know human love fails. But God's love, oh, let me tell you. Let me tell you, here's the truth of the matter. In order for the church to be who she should and is required to be, 
Our hearts must be filled with God's divine love, not human love. His love, his divine love in us, filling us. The same love the Father has for the Son. The same love the Father has for the Son in us, filling us. Then and only then can we walk in the more excellent way that is in the second half of chapter 12, verse 31, and I show you still a more excellent way. Oh, this is the way. This is the super aboundingly above anything else way. This is the way. Then this is abundantly and immeasurably better way than the way the Corinthians, the church at Corinth, are walking and the way the church of today walks because they don't see it. And no one teaches it, hardly anyone. And this is a lovely, a joyful, and a powerful walk. What kind of power? Power of God's actual love. Oh, that's powerful. It's a wellspring. It's the wellspring for all the gifts of the Spirit to work as they ought. That's why he says, for all these things, if I have not love, if I do not have, if I do not possess it, if I'm not filled with it. That's what he's talking about here. Is it just for some? Oh, no, Jesus commands us all to stay and wait so we may be filled. Because when we are filled, we will be filled with that love part of the package. Now, this love, and what really got me, I'm going to go over to 2 Corinthians 5.14, just to say this about this love, because this, is, this was a revelation, a deeper understanding. That's what I mean by revelation. It's like light bulb kind of experience. 2 Corinthians 5.14, for the love of Christ controls us. It compels us. It takes us prisoner. I love that. I'm a prisoner of the love of God. Oh, I'm captivated. I'm a captive. So that everything I do, in everything I do, I am compelled by that love. Oh, my. Having concluded this, he goes on to say that one died for all, therefore all died. If Christ hadn't died, there's really no need for us to go and put ourselves before him and say, oh, Lord, forgive me. But he died, which means we all dead until his life comes in. So that they who live may no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. For the love of Christ controls us. And we go about and we say, oh, live He'll put his life in you. So I have said the problem in the church at Corinth is lack of unity. But the root of that lack of unity is that they are not filled with the Spirit and God's divine love. If they were filled with God's Spirit and God's divine love, his actual love, then there would not be the problems that you see in Corinth and in the church today. They are infants in Christ as are many in the church today. I don't mean that in a mean way, but so as to show you there is much more. If if you are working gifts and they're not worked in the power of God's love and you're, you're doing it on your own and not by the Spirit and you're not doing it because you're compelled by God's love in your heart, He tells you, and I've already read to you, that it's nothing and profits you nothing and it isn't anything at all in the eyes of God. See, his divine love is the means by which everything, every gift works and every ministry works as it ought. So when you're taken captive by his love, then the motive for all you do is his love. 
And that is how the church becomes the church. Now, Paul's going to spend a good portion of 1 Corinthians 14 telling the believers at Corinth that they need to stop thinking like children. Verse 20, we'll pop over there for a minute, of 1 Corinthians 14. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. Now, this thinking is a heart kind of thinking, not a head kind of thinking. When the Holy Spirit purifies your heart, crucifies your sin nature, and fills you with God's divine nature, then you are also filled and made a captive of God's love. His divine love, not love for God. God's love, his He gives it to you. Same love he has for the Son. That's what Paul is teaching us all in chapter 13. So I'm going to break it out for you. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love. Verse 2, the end of the verse, but do not have love. Verse 3. The end of the verse, but do not have love. I can speak with tongues of men and angels. That is, I can speak in a language that I know or in a known language that I do not know in a tongue. Or I can speak in a heavenly language, which is unknown to anyone but me. I can. But if I do that and I don't have the divine love of God, In my heart, my motive cannot possibly be right. It cannot. No matter what I think, it cannot be right. It is by the power of God's love in you that you do this. It is you are compelled to by his love. If you're not filled with his love, you can't be compelled by his love. You won't work these things in the love of God in his divine love, and so you'll be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You'll make a lot of noise, but it won't help anyone. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries, And all knowledge, and I have all faith, even so as to remove mountains. But do not have love. I am nothing. I am not even anything. If I don't have this divine love, this love of God in my heart that has taken me captive, so everything I do is compelled by that love. If that's not happening, then all these other things, prophecy, Mysteries, knowledge, faith even to move mountains. You're mountain moving. Prophets, you nothing. You are nothing. Without his love in your heart, the motive will be wrong. It can't possibly be right until your heart is purified, sin nature gone, his nature in, his love. Captivating you and compelling you. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor and I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. What? I give all my, I'm feeding the poor. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a good work? Why? How can you say, Paul, that that's nothing? It profits me nothing. Do you not know? That even pagans do that? Even a pagan, even an unbeliever will sometimes give his life for another? Even a pagan will set up a food bank? Do you not know that most food banks from which local churches get their food for their local food closet or food pantry, those places where you get that from say, don't you dare. 
do any proselytizing. Don't you dare tell people about Jesus. So they don't, they just give people food. It profits them nothing. You see, you're not sharing the gospel, which is the thing that hungry people need more than food. And the thing that hungry, that, that, Sinners need more than for you to die on their behalf, pushing them off the tracks and dying yourself when you're hit by a train. They need Jesus. And unless you are captivated by, unless you are compelled by God's divine love, all those things are meaningless because You've never told them the gospel. You've never been the gospel for them because you're not filled with God's love. It hasn't possessed you. You haven't become its prisoner. Oh, my. Let me go on. Do you know that being filled with God's love is spoken of in Romans 5, 5? And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This isn't the measure that you get when you first believe. It is. His fullness that Paul is speaking of in Romans 5.5. 5. Because this love of God, God's actual love, fills your heart to overflowing. Poured out means filled to overflowing. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God, not for God, has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit when he fills us up, who was given to us. Romans 5.5. 5. Oh, how do we possess this love? We cry out to our Father in heaven to fill us with his Holy Spirit, and he'll give us the whole package. Glory to God, him indwelling, the Son indwelling. Oh, my. His divine nature in us, his Holy Spirit in us, his power, his love. Oh, then we are witnesses for Jesus Christ. Then we are his witnesses. It's a whole new kind of love. It's given in a moment of time. When you receive it, you suddenly see things entirely differently. And with everything that you do, the compulsion to do it is driven. You are driven by the actual divine love of God that he has placed in your heart. Nothing you can do. You cannot love enough with your human love. You need something you don't have. I was told by someone one time, a leader, that I should never tell people they need something they don't have. Oh my goodness, how can they have what they need and don't have unless I tell them they don't have it yet? (laughs) Oh my goodness. So uh, I said never mind to that particular thing. A good man does not get it yet. This is Jesus' prayer answered, this love of God, this actual divine love in your heart. Listen, in John 17, 25, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known so that the love with which you love me may be in them. Verse 26 of John 17. So that the love with which you loved me, the same love God the Father has for God the Son in us. Oh, this is what he prays. Do you think God will answer? (laughs) Yes. So this love may be in them, and I in them. 
Jesus prays to his father. Oh my goodness. And then when Jesus prays for his glory, speaks of it, his glory that he gives us, he's speaking of the Holy Spirit. This is for believers. He asks in advance of Pentecost and in advance of your personal Pentecost so that when you are filled with the Spirit, it will be fulfilled, made so. In John 17, 22, the glory which you have given me, this is the Holy Spirit, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me. I in them and you in me. We've talked about this before, so they may be perfected in unity, the same nature, the divine nature. That's what we're talking about here. Oh, my goodness. So either you have experienced your own personal Pentecost and are absolutely held captive by the love of God and compelled by it in everything that you do. You are either that, you have either had your own personal Pentecost, so that is true, or you have not. And if you have not, Jesus commands you to stay and wait so that you have had your own personal Pentecost and are captivated by, filled with, the very divine of God, love of God that is going to compel you, and I say propel you, <laughs> in everything that you do. You will be propelled forth by his power. Glory to God. And human natural love will fail, but God's love never, ever, ever fails. Verse 8, love never fails of uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Love never fails. This is divine love. This is not human love. Human love, man, you'll have so someone will do something to make you stop loving them. But oh, if you've got his divine love, it doesn't make any difference what anyone does to you. You keep on. You keep on going forward, being compelled by his love to do what? To tell them the very good news of Jesus Christ and how he can change a human heart. Glory to God. Believers in today's church have tried to love with human love, and the landscape is scattered with those whom they have wounded in their attempt, wounded by their words and their actions, Many have been driven away from local churches because the members are not taken captive by God's actual love in their hearts. And they're not compelled by that. They have other things that are compelling them to do and say what they do and say. And the result is the scattered ones. You know, in talking in verse 2 about having all knowledge, many study for years. And they have many degrees. And this allows them from seminary to analyze and dissect the, dissect the word of God. They can take it apart down to the tiniest little detail. They have plenty of man's knowledge of this word. They have degrees, but they have no degree. They have no degree of knowing him intimately. They have no degree of that. They just know stuff. And they're not compelled by the love of God. They aren't possessed by the love of God. They aren't taken captive by the love of God. They're not filled with the love of God because they're not filled with the Holy Spirit or they wouldn't write the things that they write in their commentaries. They twist. They don't know the author. Or they abnegate and disavow the truths that are in the word. And they do these things because they're not captives of the very love of God. 
Again, even if you have faith to move mountains, if it's not God's love that's compelling you, then it's nothing in God's sight. So, I've already spoken about this. So, in verses 4 through 7, we find out how you know you're filled with, possessed by, a captive of, and compelled by the very love of God. His divine love is what it's going to look like. But I'll tell you this. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and when you're filled with this love, you know it. So that's to begin with. You know it. Wow, everything's different all of a sudden in a moment of time. Everything's different. You see everything differently. There's not one thing that isn't different because you're entirely changed and your heart is entirely changed and filled with God. So, if you are one who is a captive of this love and compelled by it, here's what will happen. Here's what you will be like. You'll be patient. This is patiently enduring, no matter what you have to endure. It is kind, and this is not patting sinners on the head and saying, that's all right, you can't help it. It's the kindness that says, oh, let me tell you what God can do to get you out of your rut. If you repent, because the kindness of God is repentance, if you repent, oh, he will do wonderful things. Go to Romans for just a minute with me, Romans. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Oh, we will say it. We will. Oh, my goodness. That's the kindness of God. And it is not jealous. We don't envy. We don't envy one another. We don't try to one-up one another because we're captives of the love of God and compelled by his divine love. We do not brag because we know we're nothing apart from Jesus. We boast in him for sure. That we're supposed to do. And it's not arrogant. That is proud. Aren't I something? We're nothing. Isn't God something? Amen. He is something. Glory to God. Isn't Christ something? Oh, he is. Hallelujah. It does not act unbecomingly. Now, some people say this is like, well, you either adorn the gospel, you either are like a shining star on it, or you're not. But really, when I looked at it in the original Greek meaning, it's behave indecently. So you don't do that. You don't do what the world does because it doesn't please you any more than it pleases God to do what the world does. It does not seek its own. Hmm. You give up your right to yourself. When you cry out to be filled with the Spirit, you say, oh, Lord, you possess me. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't want to be possessed by the evil spirits that are around everywhere in and outside the church. But, oh, my, your divine love, your divine nature, oh, take over, Lord. Compelled and taken captive. By his love. Oh my. So you don't go up to somebody and say, hey, you violated my rights. You gave them up. You see how that puts an end to infighting in the church? Hmm. 
It is not provoked. That is, you don't just pop off at somebody because they do something wrong. Let me tell you, like Christ, you pray for those who spitefully use you, Matthew 5, 44, and you bless your enemies and do not curse, Luke 6, 28. How can you do that? They've done this wicked thing to you. You gave up your rights to yourself, didn't you? When you were filled with his spirit. So you see their need for Christ. And you say, oh Lord, I forgive. I forgive what they have done. Oh, but that they might know you because that's the best way I can bless them. That they might know you. He will do it. I've seen it. I've seen it with people I've ministered to who were grumpy about relatives and this and that. They do this and that. And I said, pray for them. Lo and behold, both their hearts are changed. The one that's complaining because they're judging and the one that receives the blessing it comes to know Christ. Glory to God. So you don't you don't keep a tally of wrongs. Does not take into account this tally. Okay? Joe did this, Peter did that, Jeff did that, Sue did that. X, 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 X. You don't do that. Does not, verse 6, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. So you don't celebrate what the world celebrates. Because the world is filled with unrighteousness. They're not right with God, so you don't join in. But, oh, you rejoice in the truth. You rejoice when you hear it from someone else. You rejoice when you're with another spirit-filled believer. And, oh, my goodness, you talk of the things of God, and it's, it's a rejoicing time. It's, it's joy, unspeakable, and full of glory, that kind of rejoicing in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and in the truth that there is one true God. Hallelujah. You rejoice. His joy is in you. You rejoice with it. Hallelujah. And you bear all things for the sake of Christ. Bears all things. Believes all things. You believe all things, all the promises of God. You hope all things. That isn't, gee, well, maybe, I'm not sure, but I'm hoping. No, this is an expectation that God will do it. Just according to his word. And you endure all things, even imprisonment and death, for the sake of Jesus Christ and for the sake of the gospel that tells this sinning world that there is a Savior and if they believe into him, their sins, past sins will be forgiven and he is ready and waiting to change their hearts. He is ready and waiting after they're saved. After they're reconciled to God. He is ready and waiting to fill them with everything that they need in order to walk like he walks on this earth. That many may come to believe because of that witness that's in you, Jesus himself, that divine love power of God. Oh, my. Now, this 9 through 11, some people use this to say, well, the gifts are, are not for today. But that isn't what this means. Let me show it to you. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, I'll tell you, I don't see every single bit of the whole picture of God. I don't even really know, except from the book of Revelation, what heaven looks like. 
I don't know. Look, I've just learned this new thing about becoming captive to the love of God. And they say, oh, yes, that is what you've done, Lord. He took me captive and I rejoice. So I don't know everything. We prophesy in part. Can you imagine some of the things that Isaiah had to say? You know, that a virgin will give birth. How can that be? That was a prophecy. He spoke it. He hadn't seen it. He didn't see the whole thing playing out. So you prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, and people will say, well, that's Jesus and he's come. No, this is the completion. Jesus was the one who came to put the completion into motion. Hallelujah. He was and is perfect, sinless, blameless. But this is about the time at the end when all that's left is goodness and all evil is done away. So, prophecy will be done away in eight. Tongues will cease. Knowledge will be done away because we will know. We won't need prophecy anymore to say, well, I think I, this is what the Lord's showing me. It's just a piece of it, but I see it. The partial will be done away. Partial knowledge. We will know the Lord fully. Completely, perfectly, entirely. It's the completion of God's plan to be in unity with his creation that all creatures who come to him, that all humans who come to him would have intimate, holy intimacy with him 24-7. Oh, my. We will be with him. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. That's what we're talking about. This is the perfect. This is the completion. Then Paul in 11 seems like he's talking about something entirely different, but he's not because the problem in Corinth is that they are lifting up tongues. We'll see it in the next chapter as this great thing. And it's, it's part of their infancy in Christ. They are just looking at, wow, isn't this cool? Look, I can go, you know? <laughs> And I can do it more than you. They're boasting and everything else. And you'll see it in chapter 14. But he's saying in chapter 14, verse 20, once again, brethren, do not be children in your thinking. So in verse 11 of 13, he says, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child and reason like a child. He says this to infants in Christ. He says, it's just like your little children. Your thinking and your reasoning is not mature because you're not filled with the spirit. But I really want you to be. And Christ commands you. So in the second half of 11, when I became a man, I did away with childish things. In the natural, you do. And in the spirit, you do. When you're filled with the spirit, you don't think in a childish way about the things of God. You don't treat the gifts like toys. I have more toys than you. I'm king of the mountain today. All of those things. No, 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 no. You are filled with and compelled by the very actual love of God. And you have his nature and you have his spirit. And the sin nature that made you boast is gone. And the sin nature that made you do all those other bad things are in Galatians. <laughs> the fruit of the flesh, that's gone. Because the sin nature has been crucified. Oh my goodness. You're a whole new person. You're mature. And it's in a moment of time. That doesn't mean he doesn't continue forming his character. But you don't sin against him anymore after that. So... Verse 12, 
For now we see in a mirror dimly, I like the King James Version, through a glass darkly. It's like a heavily tinted window on a car. You can see someone in there in the driver's seat, but you can't see much detail. Same kind of thing. Now we see in a mirror dimly. Literally, it's in a riddle. Because we sort of see and we see some parts. It isn't that God is hiding things. It's just that we can't even grab onto it and comprehend it. It's too vast for human mind. Now we see through glass darkly, but then face to face, no more tinted window. <laughs> now I know in part. Oh, this is wonderful. But then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. Oh, he fully knows you, if you know him. He fully knows me. Oh, I love that he fully knows me. I love that he fully knows me. I love that he has changed my heart. I love that everything I do is compelled by his love. I love being a captive of his love. I love that he knows me fully. Then he says, but now faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Three things remain. That is what abide means. Faith, hope, and love. We must have faith to believe. We must have faith that God will fill us with his spirit and his love when we cry out to him. The gift of faith in God Ephesians 2.8 says, is from God. It's not our own. He gives us that. So, and then the hope, we must have the expectation that everything God says, he will do. And that there is for us this time when we will fully know him, even as he fully knows us. But the greater and this word is the exceedingly great, high, large, much, much more of these three is to have God's actual love filling your heart. That is the exceedingly greater. That's what the church needs now. That's what the believers at Corinth needed then, beloved. That's it. If you're filled with God, you're filled with his love, and if you're filled with his love, you're a captive of it. And you're, everything you do is compelled by that love. See, that will cure her of all her ills. That is the church. That will cure her of all her ills. That will set her on the path of righteousness, and she won't move from it to the left or to the right. Then she will be compelled by no other motive but God's actual divine love. And she will be a captive of that love forever. Glory to God. What a future he has for you. And your future can be now. Your future can be now. He tells the church at Corinth, they need something they don't have. And I tell the church today, you need something you don't have. How do I know you don't have it? You are not patient, not kind to one another. You are jealous of one another and all of the other things that are here. So I beseech you, obey Jesus. Stay and wait. And he will surely fill you with his spirit and the divine love of God. Kill out that sin nature. Oh my goodness. You will be new. And you will be his witness here. Just as he commands. Father, thank you. That's all I can say. I can't even not enumerate the things for which I thank you. Jesus, thank you for coming and dying and rising that I might be saved. And 
ascending and being glorified that I might have this great love in me that has captivated me, that I'm a prisoner of, and that I'm compelled by. My goodness. Holy Spirit, have your way with this teaching in Jesus' name. Amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan and pour out his spirit.